Hello and welcome to the Big Blue View YouTube channel, New York Giants fans. The Giants begin rookie minicamp on Friday, so we're getting closer and closer to uh, to real football. The uh, OTAs will come up uh, a little bit later on this month, which will be the first time we'll get to see the uh, the entire team on the field. And I thought what we would do at this point with, with free agency mostly done, with the draft gone, I thought we would sort of assess the roster and assess whether the Giants have gotten better and, and maybe how much farther they still have to go uh, to, to get really where they want to be. And uh, here to help me do that is Big Blue Views' Tony Del Genio. Tony, thank you very, very much uh, for the time. Good to be here. And, uh, you know, Tony, I, I thought we would start, you, you did the, a piece the other day on how bad teams become good teams. And it's funny because Dan Hatman of the scouting Academy, and I have had this conversation a few times and some of it involves luck. Some of it involves simply, you know, landing in the right place at the right time to grab the player or sometimes, you know, having that that day three pick or undrafted free agent turn into something that nobody that nobody saw coming. And it's amazing how much with all the resources and all the man hours and all the money that teams spend on on player evaluation and player scouting, it's amazing that sometimes it can come down to that. Yeah. I mean, look at look at last year's draft. And you're the Houston Texans, and there was probably a 50-50 chance that Carolina takes C.J. Stroud with the number one pick, and then you wind up taking probably Bryce Young with the number two pick. And and then the big question is, would that have made any difference or not? Uh, Stroud looked uh, so much better than Young as a rookie, but how much of that was a function of the situation that Bryce Young got dumped into, which which is as, as much of a dumpster fire as any team in the NFL can, can be right now, Carolina. And uh, how much of it was that Houston was just that kind of that one player away at a key position from being a, a very good team. Well, we, yeah, we, there's no way to know the answer to that because we can't switch the quarterbacks, but, but there sure was some luck involved. Uh, how much luck was involved in Ryan Poles, uh, trading down from number one last year to Carolina. And then a year later getting the number one pick anyway, because Carolina was, was so bad. And that's not something I think you can anticipate a, a year in advance. And so, yeah, there's, there's so much luck involved in all of this. Absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's also interesting because it's, Oftentimes, it's a matter of finding that right three or four players to really elevate your your franchise, and it sort of goes into a piece that I did, sort of following on your piece, which uh, a lot of questions about Giants general manager Joe Shane and the job he's done now in three off seasons. So we, I kind of assessed the roster he was handed at the end of the 2021 season. And what the roster looks like now. And I think my overall assessment, keeping special teams out of it, um, was if you look at 10 positions, I graded six as better and four as not quite as good. And and there's 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 grades of better, there's you know, there, there's shades of 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 color in all of those things. But I would say that this roster right now is marginally better uh, most of the way around. And, and even in most cases, the positions where it's not better, there's a chance for it to be equally as good. Um, and yet all of that, all of that leads back to just how hard it is to turn a bad football team into a good one. Yeah, and you know, I think, and I think these are other things that that you alluded to within your piece. That there are there are additional factors besides just the players themselves and whether this unit looks better than this other unit. Because number one, 
and you mentioned this that that you know Joe Shane comes in with Brian Dable and they have a different philosophy, especially on offense, than the Giants had before that, right? And so part of what the Giants have done is not just trying to replace players with better players, but trying to replace players with better places at, with better players at the positions that they see as most valuable to winning in the NFL today. And so, so yeah, the running back room looks like it's not as good as it is now because they let Saquon Barkley walk, but the wide receiver room looks a heck of a lot better because not only, I mean, have they, have they added wide receivers, they've added a wide receiver relatively high in the draft for three consecutive years. And I think that's telling you something about, about Joe Shane and Brian Dable's priorities. Right. And it's, and it's no surprise that, that they want to emphasize the passing game. Uh, to me, the only surprise is that Buffalo didn't do more of that the last five years when, when Joe Shane was part of the, the uh, front office there and Brian Dable was the offensive coordinator. They, they got uh, Stefan Diggs in a trade, but, but they didn't consistently draft wide receivers high in Buffalo, which always, always surprised me a little bit considering the quarterback they had. Uh, but, but, but Shane has surely done that with the giants. And that's because they want the giants to become a passing team. And so, so those, those changes in philosophy of, of how you operate your, your offense are I think are are part of this equation here. The other thing is I think, and that we we keep on forgetting, is the mess that Joe Shane found the Giants in financially when he got there. I mean, he walked in and everyone knows that they were forty million dollars in the red when he first walked in the door, and so that first year wasn't wasn't very much about acquiring players. Certainly not in free agency. It was about you know, getting yourself out from being underwater. And so you let a, a good defensive back like uh, James Bradbury walk. You had uh, no choice. Because you really don't have much of a choice. The, you weren't, you didn't know where you were going to get the $10 million from or whatever it was that he was, uh, he was due that year. Uh, and so you, you have to make some, you know, some, some hard decisions. There may have been other players, uh, free agents that they released, be, not because they didn't think they were good players, but because they just, had to get out of the hole that they were in financially. And so all of those things kind of play into, into, you know, where, where you want to go with the roster. And now, you know, you're looking at, at year three and now you've got yet another new philosophy uh, and that's on defense, right? Where you're transitioning from, from the Wink Martindale style of defense, which is heavy man and, and other uh, things to, to uh, Shane Bowens, which is a lot more zone and uh, maybe you might say more traditional roles for, for some of the players. And so uh, it's something that you, you kind of have to do on the fly. And I think part of what, what you showed in terms of what's better and what's worse right now reflects those changing priorities. I think that one of the things about those changing priorities and something that I have I have said in other places, you brought up the mess that that Joe was handed when he took the job. To me, um it's really been two years of getting out from under that mess. In the first year he admitted, you know, he had very little money to spend and you say what you want about Mark Lewinsky. Mark Lewinsky was the best he could do because it was the money that he had available, you know, as far as an offensive lineman. He just and he said, I just can't go shopping at the the level of the market that I that I'd really like to. And in a lot of ways, I think that was true last year as well. I really think that it took two off seasons to really get the financial house in order, to get the contract situations in order. And it really took this offseason, and and we can gnash our teeth about letting Saquon Barkley and Xavier McKinney go, but what Joe really did this offseason was really put his marker down on where he would prefer to spend money as he builds this team. He made a huge move for Brian Burns. He let Xavier McKinney walk because he wasn't going to 
pay top of the market for a safety, even though he's a good young player. And I think the Giants probably hated to see him walk. They replaced him with Tyler Newbin. Um, they kind of did the same thing a year ago with Julian Love. They decided, you know, they 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 let him walk. They replaced him with a less expensive player in in Jason Pinnock. They they have built more or less what what they had in Buffalo now with a with a running back by committee with with Devin Singletary with Tyrone Tracy with Eric Gray maybe with a veteran coming in at some point, but. They've built all of that, and Devin Singletary's a good player. He's not Saquon Barkley, but he's a good player. They've built all of that for a lot less money than, than the Eagles are paying Saquon Barkley. So I, I really think, and I've written this, as it stands now, this is really finally, to me, Joe Shane's team. It reflects Joe Shane's priorities. It reflects his the way that he wants to build this team. And I think from here on out going forward is I think when you really begin to judge Joe Shane's work. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I, I agree with that completely. And, and I don't think from the outside and especially me on the, on the outside, uh, I don't think as fans, we can appreciate fully what, their thinking is on the inside because i don't know that we even know all the elements of their philosophy i mean the the, the pass first run second change in 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 philosophy is is something that's of no surprise to anyone but you know but even other other finer details you know so so giants fans right are always upset when the giants don't draft linemen right and so you wonder why why especially in round six when you had christian mahogany there did the giants not not take him and uh yeah. you don't you don't know what the answer to that actually is it could be that that uh, they just were taking a, a best player available view at that point when you get to to round six and saying uh that uh Muasau, is that is that his uh, pronunciation yes, is that was, mm -hmm. uh, was the was the best player available but then there also might be you know what they see as scheme fits for the running game and one of the things about the about the giants running game i know you know i noticed last year i mean they run both both kind of you know zone blocking and 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 man gap uh blocking schemes but if you look at what they actually did last year they they about two-thirds of the time they were a, a zone blocking uh, team and mahogany although he's played both kinds was a more of a a man power gap type style of block he's more of a kind of physical mauling type of of guard than a than a mobile guard who who uh you know gets out uh on on an outside zone play and stuff like that and so you know there could even be considerations like that where they say well this guy looks like he's good but this isn't the type of guard you know we want to have and so we're we're not going to take him uh same thing with the defensive lineman chris john boyd that was also there in round six uh looks like he has has some talent but again looks like a kind of a very physical mauling run stuffing type of defensive tackle and maybe they said to themselves well we've got those kinds of guys on the roster already if we're going to draft a defensive lineman we want to draft someone with more pass rush juice and so we'll, we'll pass on this guy in favor of of somebody else yeah there, there are all those things that we don't really know uh, how their thinking proceeds in making those picks i have a couple of comments on that tony and the first one is I just, I have to love people who are killing Joe Shane over the sixth round pick. The friggin' sixth round pick, people. It's the sixth round pick. It's a guy who's a flyer, who's a developmental player, who's probably not going to play much in 2024 anyway. You're killing Joe Shane over the sixth round pick. And part of that probably is because nobody knew who Darius Muasau was. And, you know, I'll be honest, I probably would have picked Christian Mahogany too. He's a player I studied. He's a player I liked. You know, he's a player I was surprised was still on the board in the sixth round. But I'm not going to kill Joe Shane over, over picking Darius Muasau because I didn't know the player. Yeah. I don't know what plan they might have for him. Um, 
you know, I'll also look at the fact that the Giants only had six picks, didn't have a seventh round pick. They may have gotten to the point where they looked at it and they said, on our list of players, whether it's six, seventh round undrafted free agents, the one guy we want in our building that's on our list is Muasau. You know, so they, you know, so you make choices and there's always, you know, there's opportunity cost no matter what choice you make you're giving up on a different opportunity but people it's a sixth round pick let it go <laughs> let it go yeah, it's not yeah. gonna it's not gonna make or break the franchise let yeah. it go That's right um the other point that i wanted to make in regards to sometimes not knowing the philosophy and i almost want to tread lightly here because i know how much people scream about at least in the past about giants ownership being too involved and in decision-making and the Mara family and all of that. But people have complained about Saquon Barkley not being traded last year at the deadline. If the giants were just going to let him go, um, the, you know, they, they ask about the quarterback decision. We don't know how much Joe Shane is operating within parameters that are set by John Mara. We don't know. I mean, John Mara said last year he didn't want to see Saquon Barkley traded at the deadline. That doesn't mean he would have absolutely vetoed the idea, but it probably meant that if you were going to trade him, you better get a really good return, which just wasn't going to be there. So we don't know if Joe Shane is operating completely under with, with carte blanche, basically. We don't know if he's operating and John Mara has said, do whatever you want, do whatever you need to do. Um, you know, or if he said, if you're going to do this, you better check with me first, you know? So, so we don't know. I mean, there's, there's always that factor too. And, and I don't want to point the finger at John Mara because I don't know. I don't know how involved he is. I don't know if he was involved in the choice not to draft a quarterback at six. I don't really know. He had said the Giants had the green light to go get a quarterback, but I don't know if that green light came with guardrails. So we don't know. Um, maybe someday when he's not when he's not Giants general manager anymore, maybe someday Joe Shane will talk about that. But but who knows? So, so as you said, we don't know exactly, you know, what goes into every decision. We just know that lots and lots of hours, lots and lots of discussion, lots and lots of money is poured into all of that. And that, that the giants have more information than we do. Yeah. And the, th and the third thing that, that we don't know, which I think Joe Shane has has alluded to in in the past uh, in interviews is that they have a lot fewer players on their big board in the first place than people on the outside imagine, and then there are players that never make it to their big board not because of their football abilities, but because of of off the field concerns, whether those are injury histories that they find problematic or or personal uh histories <laughs> that they find uh problematic and and so on and so forth you know I, I mean just just right now right in the in the news we're we're reading a lot about rashi rice right who now has has been involved in in several things let's say since coming to the to the kansas city chiefs and uh uh you know you don't know how much they and i don't mean you i mean we all don't know how much uh they know about some of these players that makes them a little queasy about about taking them them on and uh, and it's pretty clear that they want you know players players that, that that they feel they can trust off the field as well as on the field so that they're they're not getting into into some of these these difficult situations that that sometimes occur and, and so that 
you know, those things alone, and again, in, in addition to injury concerns, I mean, and talking about mahogany, mahogany, I believe, is coming off an ACL, uh, and uh, I, I, which was the previous year, so presumably he's recovered from it, but he does have an injury history. And uh, you just don't you know, know how much of that stuff they know about that the rest of us don't know about. Clearly, Absolutely. they know more than most of the rest of us. Absolutely. Do. The medical information never really gets out. A lot of the background check information doesn't get out. I've talked to Dan Hatman of the Scouting Academy about this. I've talked to other people who have been involved in, in making these kinds of decisions in the NFL. And, and as you said, you would be surprised. There are, you know, once you get into compensatory picks and all of that, you know, between 255 and 260 players drafted. There's, you go to the, the NFL mock draft database and there's probably 500 players listed in there, maybe more. NFL teams enter drafts with a board of 150 players, somewhere around that number, give or take. Generally 150 players that they would be interested in drafting. So they're not entering the draft with that with that list of 400 guys. They're entering with, these are the 150 players that we think fit us. And then they may have a supplementary list if they get to the end of the draft and all of those guys are gone or whatever. But, but they, you know, they're not sitting there choosing between 300 guys. They're sitting there looking at, okay, these are the 150 or so that, that we've targeted and you know x and guys off as they go and and as you said it could be for reasons like you know like rasheed rice it could be for medical reasons it could be just that that you know some of the things they've been told about a guy's work ethic don't fit what they want it could be scheme fit it could be a lot of things but a team's draft board isn't as big as you might think it is and this year in particular, this was an unusual year because of the, I guess, the uh, the COVID era rule about, about years of eligibility. And so apparently a lot of players decided to go back to school for another year. And so the the, the size of the draft class uh, is is not as was not as as deep as in previous years and and i remember reading before the draft that people were saying that after about after round four or five the the value really really drops off in this draft because so many players went back to school in his pre-draft press conference Shane talked about that and i don't know if people picked up on this but he said that Dennis Hickey, who is one of his assistants, former GM in, in Miami, they had they had draftable grades on 150 players who went back to school. So that took 150 players, possible players, off the Giants draft board. You know, a lot of those guys might have been, you know, later day two, day three guys. But that's just an example. That's 150 players that they might have considered, you know, putting on their draft board, you know, on their final draft board who who went back to school. So, so yes, this particular draft was not as deep as as people might have hoped it would be in a lot of places. But yeah, anyway, so, go, ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, no go no, ahead. No, 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 no. no, that's I was I was I was just gonna say. Really, looking at the Giants offseason as a whole, you know, and there's things that they didn't get done. There's things they did that people didn't like. They let Saquon Barkley go. They rebuilt the running back room in a different way. They didn't draft an offensive lineman. They didn't draft a defensive lineman. They are, as you said, you know, changing defensive schemes. They don't have a clear answer at cornerback two. Um, they're still waiting on a decision from, from Darren Waller, who knew as far as I'm concerned is, <clears throat> excuse me, as far as I'm concerned, should just go ahead and, and announce his retirement because it, it's clear he's not committed at this point. They have, you know, they have a question at safety because we haven't seen Tyler Newbin play yet, but you know, the, the question becomes simply, is the roster better 
today than it was when when the 2023 season ended. Uh, and be, before I give my take on that, I'm going to ask you, you know, where you stand on that. Is this entering 2024? Is it in your eyes a better roster than uh, than than the Giants ended the year with? So I think it, I think my answer is that it has the potential to be a better roster than the one that they ended 2023 with. And I'll, and, and the reason I say potential is that they have replaced players with other players who have yet to prove themselves in a Giants uniform. So if I, if I think about the, the, uh, the different position groups. First of all, I mean, let, I, let's just dispense with with wide receiver. Okay, I mean, you know, adding Malik Neighbors, uh, <laughs> that's that's got to make your wide receiver room better. I happen to think that the Giants' wide receiver room was not that bad uh, before that. But what you're doing by adding Malik Neighbors is that he sort of immediately kind of slots in as your as your wide receiver one in that offense and. And so there's a difference between having uh, Jalen Hyatt and and Darius Slayton and Wandale Robinson uh, as your one, two, and threes versus having them as your two, three, and fours. And it's not just because of the addition of Malik Neighbors. It's because that whoever one of those guys, let's say Hyatt, let's say you regard Hyatt as your wide receiver uh, one last year or, or Slayton as your wide receiver one last year. Well, those guys now are, are number two instead of number one, which means that that they're seeing a cornerback who's probably not as good as the cornerbacks they were seeing uh, the previous year. And so you not only get the direct benefit of adding someone like neighbors, you get the indirect benefit of, of the next guy on the list, seeing a less capable cornerback most weeks than, than he did last season. And so I think it helps the entire wide receiver room to have that depth. And when you actually look at that wide receiver room, other than Isaiah Hodgins, who's kind of the one sort of classical X type big guy, not very fast receiver. That wide receiver room is fast. They have, they have lots of speed in that receiver group. And that, that definitely, I think is, is in line with, with their philosophy. So, so I think that's a really easy one to just dispense with right, right away. I think, I think that's a, a clear win, but if, but you look at some of the other things. And so you look at safety. So obviously getting rid of, or letting, or letting Xavier McKinney walk is going to hurt you. Uh, McKinney had his pros and his cons, right? He missed a lot of time with injuries, some on the field and some self-inflicted. All right. But, and, and when he was on the field, he was uneven. He had, he had good periods and he had bad periods on the field, but when he was good, he was, he was, you know, very good. So overall it's going to hurt to lose him and to, to stick a second round rookie in there in his place. Well, you can't expect that Tyler Newbin is going to just walk onto the field and 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 be as good as McKinney right away. And so I would say in the short term, that's a loss for the Giants. On the other hand, Newbin was regarded as by many people as the best safety in the draft. And round two is is exactly the right time to start drafting safeties. That's when McKinney was drafted. That's when Antoine Winfield was drafted and so on. And so it's the right time to take a safety. And if he was by most people thought to be the best safety in the draft, then that was a good move by them. And the more I, I read about Newbin, the more he sounds like the right kind of guy for the Giants. And so while at the moment, I would say you have to say the safety position doesn't look as good as it did last year. A year from now, it could look better than it did last year as Newbin gets used to the NFL. And, and, and if he plays up to what we're hearing about him, then, then all of a sudden that, that looks like a, a win or at least a, a wash for the Giants, but at a much, much lower cost. So you have things like that that, that uh, you know I think are difficult to anticipate until you actually see these people on the field. Same thing with Andrew Phillips, uh, as I think you... Uh, you, you noted to a couple of us earlier this morning, PFF just 
uh, rated Andrew Phillips as the best pick in the third round in the draft. And there's this big question as to what they're going to do with him. Is he just going to take over at slot receiver or do they actually think he could be the outside CB2 that, as you mentioned, you know, it's totally up in the air who's going to play that for the Giants. But whatever position he plays, it sounds like he's a really good player and a really good addition to the secondary. And so, yeah, not having Bradbury, for uh, not having a Dory Jackson, that's going to hurt. But they're trying to add players who could become as good as as what you had, but at a much lower cost. And so you, I think you have lots of examples like that. Same thing with the offensive line, right? They've made changes in the offensive line. On paper, the line looks better than it has. We'll have to wait and see how they actually play. And of course, looming over all of that is the big question of who winds up at right tackle. But But again, that looks like it could be a better group, but with the provision that they haven't played it down yet together as a group, and you don't know how effective they're going to be as a group. One of the things I will say when we talk about Andrew Phillips, we talk about cornerback. The Giants have Phillips. They have Cordell Flott. They still have Nick McLeod, who played well in limited opportunities a year ago. Uh, they they liked Trey Hawkins' sixth-round pick a year ago enough to start him at the beginning of the year. They have options. We don't know how it's going to develop. But one thing I will say when people are in panic mode about cornerback two, Adoree Jackson is a name brand NFL player, but Adoree Jackson did not play up to his name last year. Adoree Jackson did not play well, to be honest. And I like Adoree. Adoree's a great guy to talk to. I've talked to him a bunch of times in the locker room. Um, but he did not play well a year ago. So the reality is that in terms of replacing the performance that the Giants got out of cornerback two a year ago, the bar is not that high. It really isn't that high because they just didn't get – if you take Tay Banks out of the equation – Whatever the Giants got on the other side, the beginning of the year would have been Trey Hawkins, and that didn't go well. The rest of the year was mostly, uh, you know, Adoree Jackson, and he didn't play up to his previous career standards. So it's not like you're trying to replace Patrick Sertan out there. <laughs> you know, you're not you're not trying to replace an All Pro cornerback out there. So building for the future, giving themselves some options. We'll see. And, and you're absolutely right about the offensive line. You know, you're right about, we don't know how the, you know, how a lot of things are going to work out the defensive, the defensive line rotation, the, the tight end situation with Waller likely retiring. Daniel Bellinger's a solid player. Uh, Chris Manhurts, Jack Stoll are, are quality blockers. Theo Johnson, fourth round pick. Maybe he's a developmental guy. Maybe he can give them more in the passing game than uh, you know initial than than people think initially. But have to let it all play out. All we can do is look at the roster right now and think of think what it might be. One thing I will say, Tony, that I think we have to talk about. One of the things that I have talked about for years now, when I get asked about the Giants and what do they need? Do they need this position? Do they need that position? One of my default answers has always been they need game-changing players. And for me, what they've done this offseason, yes, they subtracted Saquon Barkley. So, you know, but they they rebuilt that running that running back room with Devin Singletary, who's a good player. He's not Saquon Barkley, but if you dive into the numbers, his production's been pretty darn close to Barkley's in in, in recent years. So that may not be, especially as we've talked about with the Giants, sort of trying to change the philosophy of how they run their offense. That may not be. You know, as as big a loss as it might look like on paper, but what I what I wanted to say is, when it comes to game changers, 
the Giants added two game-changing players in premium positions this offseason, that being Malik Neighbors in the first-round pick and Brian Burns as an edge on defense. And and for me, that's a that's a huge step in the right direction. Both of those are young players you know, with, with a lot of runway ahead of them in their careers. And, and, and that's huge to add individual guys who are among the best or should be among the best at their positions and can, and can change and dominate games um, is, is a massive thing. Yeah. And and I mean, I'm glad you mentioned Brian Burns, but there's, there's another situation where not only I think will Brian Burns help the giants directly in terms of what what he can do on the field but it probably makes life easier for Kayvon Thibodeau because I mean if I'm an opposing offense I think I'm going to pay probably more attention to Brian Burns than I would have to whoever was playing at the other edge whether it was Aziz Oshalari or you know or, or uh, Boogie Basham or or uh, whoever was was there last year. Uh, yeah, I think, I think last year when you went up against the giants, you, you devote most of your attention to Thibodeau. And uh, now I think first and foremost, they're going to make sure that they're trying to take care of Burns. And so I'm, I'm guessing that that Burns is going to be the one who sees the, who sees the, the tight end on his side more often trying to, trying to chip him and prevent him getting to the quarterback. Uh, also with the change in defensive philosophy, with the change in, in coordinators, uh, you may see people like Thibodeau rushing the passer more often, not dropping back into coverage so much, and and so on and so forth. And so, again, you know, again, you you know, you add a premier player at one position or a potentially premier player in the case of Neighbors. I mean, he hasn't he hasn't played it down yet in the NFL, so we should not get ahead of ourselves. But uh, you you add premier players, and it helps everyone else by taking the the attention away from them. Absolutely. And Tony, the one thing we have to talk about before we, you know, before we, we wrap it up here, we have to talk about quarterback a little bit. And obviously, you know, it's the whole Daniel Jones thing. And, and, and what I'm, you know, people talk a lot about Drew Locke and can Drew Locke take the job away from Daniel Jones. And I want to, what I want to say is I'll believe it when I see it. Okay. Go go look at what Drew Locke has done in his career, okay. And I, if I'm not mistaken, they came into the they came into the NFL in the same season. Locke as a second round pick, Jones as a sixth overall pick. Drew Locke is on his third NFL team. Drew Locke, for all of his arm strength and what people have said about him, Drew Locke has never in his career played as well as Daniel Jones did in 2022. He's never come close to playing as well as Daniel Jones did in 2022. And what I'm going to say is really in the in the long term, in the long view, in the what is the future of the Giants, what does the future of the franchise look like, who plays quarterback in 2024, whether it's Jones, if he's healthy enough, if he plays well enough, whether it's Drew Locke, whether it's Nathan Rourke or Tommy DeVito, it really doesn't matter. Unless it's Jones and he's playing at a 2022 level or better. Because if it's Drew Locke or one of those other guys, or if it's Daniel Jones playing badly, then we don't have a clue who the quarterback is in 2025. If it's Daniel Jones and he's playing well, then you can argue that he can stay as the quarterback in 2025. If Drew Locke is starting, then you know, I don't want to I don't want to demean Drew Locke, but if Drew Locke is playing significant football for the Giants in in 2024, even into 2025, he's just a placeholder. In my view, he's just a placeholder and the Giants still don't have their answer. So for me, the only guy on the roster who can truly solve the quarterback puzzle for the Giants is Daniel Jones. And I don't know that he can do it. 
I just don't know this far into his career if he can do it. So it it it's a huge question. And all of the other improvements aside, if the Giants don't get good quarterback play in 2024, then you know, then they're not going to look very good. Yeah. And and you know, hopefully the other moves that they've made will work out and will create conditions that are more conducive to Jones having success this year. Hopefully they'll have a, a functioning offensive line that gives him decent pass protection. Doesn't have to be great, just decent pass protection and not like the, the disaster that the, that the line was, especially at the beginning of, of last year to just to see, okay, what can he, what can he do if he's, if he's got a pocket to work with, that's, that's, that, that, that at least forms and lasts for a couple of, of seconds, you know, what, what can he do? And now they've got a, a game breaking wide receiver who is just great at getting open as he himself tells you <laughs> and you know tony it's, it's it's also interesting um we talk about saquon barkley being gone and we talked a little bit earlier in the show about the giants wanting to to be more of a pass first team and the way that i always phrase it is they want to be a quarterback centric offense okay in 2022 the giants played a certain way they for a lot of the year they they kind of had Jones in bubble wrap a little bit. They they ran things through Saquon. Um, they ran a lot of play action. As the year went on, they put more and more on Jones's plate. I was looking at the numbers the other day, and the reality of it is, the Giants, Daniel Jones and Saquon Barkley played less than two and a half games together in 2023. They played week one and week two and part of week six when, you know, before Jones got hurt. What I found interesting was I had this impression that the Giants had, and I, I think I've said it before, when, when Jones was in the game, they ran their offense one way, which was through Jones. When Tyrod Taylor or Tommy DeVito were playing quarterback, they ran their offense another way, which was through Saquon Barkley. And I went back and I looked at the numbers. In week one and week two, with Jones playing quarterback, Saquon carried 12 times week one and 17 times week two. When Jones got hurt against Miami in week six, Barkley had seven carries at that point in the game when Jones went out basically at halftime. Every single game, Joan, or Barkley had, by my count, one, two, three, four, five, six games without Daniel Jones in the lineup where he carried the ball between 18 and 36 times. They ran their offense through Saquon when Tommy DeVito and Tyrod Taylor was, was at quarterback. They ran their offense through Daniel Jones with Saquon Barkley as a secondary piece when when Jones was in the lineup and and I thought the difference was pretty stark and I'm not sure it was smart so yeah and well ob so obviously as you say yeah they they want to be a quarterback centric offense and so they tried to do that coming coming out of the gate um and the once once Andrew Thomas got injured, you know, talked about only playing a couple of games with with Barkley, but he he only played kind of part of a game with with Andrew Thomas. And Andrew Thomas he played, played one series of the season with Andrew say, Thomas well, fully healthy. That's right. That's, that's what I was going to say because it was that first drive, right? You know, right. and you keep on thinking back to that first drive. It's like, you know, what what happens if if they kick the field goal on that first on that first drive and and it's and it's you know it's not blocked. Is it going to wind up forty to nothing anyway? Or I don't know. They were you know they were fairly conservative on that first drive, but uh, but they moved the ball against the Dallas defense, and I feel like that 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 was that was just it just ruined the that that one drive ruined the entire uh, season for them. At any rate, though, the the you know the thing is that as you say, they 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 want to run the offense through the quarterback. And so this year, they're, they've tried to do what they can to make that happen again. And, you know, the questions will be, 
if he can get decent protection, then will he show that he can do the types of read progressions that you need a successful NFL quarterback to, to do? Will he show you that he can throw with anticipation, throw guys open, Okay, because because neighbors is the type of guy you can throw open. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. You know, and so can he throw guys open instead of throwing at guys who have already started to to get open? And that's the difference between completing a pass but being tackled immediately versus versus uh, completing a pass and getting an extra 10 or 20 yards after the after the catch and so I think you know in, I, I'm guessing that in their minds they're saying okay we're we're gonna give you the environment that's going to make it possible for you to do these things now you have a limited opportunity to show us that you can do those things. And, and I think the right. record this year is not that important. I think it's the question of whether he looks like he's capable of taking a step beyond 2022. That's the big thing. Right. And I thought that's kind of what they were asking of him a year ago, because I go back to the contract. They gave him the contract coming off of the 2022 season. And I said right away, I said, they didn't give him the contract to be the player that he was in 2022. They gave him the contract because they think that he can be more than what he showed in 2022. And I think they asked that right away last year, but they didn't with the offensive line mess and, 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 and everything else, they didn't create the environment where that was ever going to work. Yeah. And, and, and actually with the offensive line mess, I mean, so part of it is, is adding the veterans and, and I think maybe that's one of them, you know, and, and I, I guess you have to, uh, a new general manager is going to take some time, I guess, to, to learn the things he needs to learn himself. And I don't know what Shane would say the lessons he's learned are, but, but hopefully he, He's learned something about offensive lines that that you can't re- rely too much on rookies, uh, because this year he brought in veterans, and that yes, they didn't draft an offensive lineman, but they brought in five veterans to to compete for offensive line spots, and at least two of them, if not three of them, could wind up actually being starters this year. And so, uh, you know, I think I think that was part of their problem last year was that they put too much faith in guys that they drafted to step on the field right away and, and contribute when maybe they should have been uh, sitting in the background more for a couple of years. Granted, you have to have the money to, to sign veteran free agents. And this year was the first year they, they could uh, you know do some of that. But then the other thing is, the whole question of the offensive line coach and and was Bobby Johnson really that bad uh, that that the the line would look this bad or was it just a function of the players being that bad and and so now they they have an opportunity both with new players and with a new coach who had success last year with a with a, a line that was not all that stellar they've got two chances to make that offensive line functional and so if they can do that then you 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 finally have the answer to what Daniel Jones ceiling actually is adequate offensive line play and average to slightly above average quarterback play would go a long way, Tony. Yeah. Not to a super bowl. And I think, you know, uh, it's the, the, the larger question of what do you actually need to win a super bowl today is hanging out there, but it's hanging out there for frankly, 31 other teams in the NFL right yes. right now right yes. so, so imagining taking Patrick Mahomes out in the Super Bowl is 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 a, a dream for another day and it's a dream you, that, you, that you all need the other teams have as well but you need Patrick Mahomes Andy Reid and Travis Kelsey to just decide they've had enough yeah, yeah, yeah. we've accomplished <laughs> everything we need to accomplish we're, yeah <laughs> we're gonna go yeah to <laughs> All right, Tony, I appreciate it. Uh, Giants fans, I hope you uh, you have enjoyed it as well. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe to, to support our channel here on YouTube. Thank you, as always, for listening. Please stay safe out there, take care of each other, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.